okay? I can hear you just fine. I'm switching the screen over to you. Perfect. All right, cool. And everyone Look can see my screen, hopefully? Yes, it looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, all right. Want me to dive right in? Yeah, go ahead. Thank Perfect. you. So uh, today we're talking about innovative technologies and tech trends. Um, so what I do uh, is I run a collaborative platform that aims to change the way people see libraries by partnering up with different startups and bringing their technologies into library spaces. So some of the slides that you're going to see include uh, a couple conferences I go to, and I'll talk talk to those points, as well as uh, how to kind of reach out and how to find those new technologies. When thinking about technology or new new technology, you have to understand there's all there's always risk and reward. Uh, being the first person to grab the first product or the first release of something, uh, yeah, you get you get bragging rights, but at the same time, there's a lot of risk involved. Like, does it actually work? Does it hold up to what the value that the company says it is? So there's a lot of experimentation. Um, one of the best pitches you can make to implement new technology into your library space is by calling it a pilot program or a beta test. Um, those types of words go really well uh, when trying to sell to board members, public, etc. Um, because everyone wants to be involved in something that's beta or a pilot. And so, but keep that in mind when you're when I show these slides of technology. It doesn't mean you have to get it, or it doesn't mean it is the future. Um, these are just some of the things that are out there, and whether or not they're good or, or not for your environment is entirely up to you. So I'm actually going to talk about how you can stay informed first before we go into all the cool products. Um, build a big face, uh, LinkedIn network. Sometimes Facebook works pretty well and Twitter. Uh, follow on, be, be active on those social platforms and keep on engaging people because everyone's sharing really great ideas and I'm not the only one that, that knows of cool tech and I take some of my ideas from other people. So it's this constant ecosystem of sharing ideas and sharing progress and, and, and new, uh, new concepts. The other thing to check out is crowdsourced websites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter. I follow those like almost religiously and I think I spent too much time on there, too much money helping fund product, projects and ideas, but there's a lot of really cool stuff on there. And I'm actually gonna have a couple of slides that show products that my company's partnered up with to uh, experiment with and beta test. Uh, Conference-wise, there's two really big conferences I encourage people to attend, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show and the South by Southwest, uh, which is in Texas. And then here's a list of websites that you can check out that, uh, are really useful to stay informed on what's, what's hot. So quickly, um, the Consumer Electronics Show, they do it every single year in Vegas, so the location's nice. And it's right in January, so you don't have to deal with any winter uh, in our Chicagoland area. And it runs the first full week in January. It is a humongous event. There's over 3,600 exhibitors and 170,000 industry professionals that you can network with, talk to, collaborate with, et cetera. Uh, and it's over 2.2 million square feet, which is roughly the size of 38 football fields. And so that's a lot of walking. And for those that have seen me in person, I'm not a big active guy. I don't really like walking. And so I made an exception to attend this conference. And I think I clocked in like 12 miles in a single, in over uh, the course of two days. And so I did my workout for the next several years. CES is highly interactive and highly engaging and exhibitors spend countless dollars on their exhibits. So this is Intel's exhibit. I once asked, hey, what do you guys do with this stuff when you're done with it? And sometimes they actually just chuck it. And I was like, wow, I would like some of these like LED monopod things and have those in my front room. I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, some of the exhibits are two floors and they build giant structures in the exhibit hall for people to kind of demo and, and, and experiment with all the latest and greatest technology. And then you have your, your typical type of booths and exhibits. The, the sheer size of some of the exhibits is frightening. So this is like the Audi booth and you see a lot of new cars and, and how the self-driving car industry is taking off and what that pertains and what that is all about. Here's a, uh, the Panasonic booth. So I took it from one angle all the way down to the other. And like that is just Panasonic. Sony has one similar in size. LG has one similar in size. So some of the really big, big brand name companies have giant booths. 
and exhibits where you can play with and experiment with and do a lot of hands-on interaction with some of the latest and greatest technology. So through that and through other conversations, I made a list of hot topics that we're going to cover today. And we're going to break these down. And don't worry about taking notes on all the slides either. I'll share these slides with Luis so you can just download them uh, if you like. I have 155 slides to go through, so I'm going to try to get through some of the, the boring picture ones and give you more content, if that's all right with everybody. So the maker revolution is probably the one of the hottest topics, especially in library land, where people are wanting to build solutions to problems. Um, it, it's call, I'm calling it a revolution instead of a movement because it's kind of a really big deal now where people are identifying problems in the closed market. So uh, problems with operating systems and how we can fix that and how we can make it better. Uh, Google's actually working on a phone called Project Aurora where they're taking apart uh, cell phones essentially and allowing you to be able to modular cell phones. So if, you, if your dad, battery dies, you don't have to buy a brand new phone. You just swap out that module. If you want a better camera, you just swap out that module. And so people are coming up with ways to improve products that we have currently and make them more affordable and more usable. Uh, one of the other things to keep in mind with maker technology is the, the pictures that, or the products that I'm going to show you have low, low floors and high ceilings. And what that mean is that the cost of entry or cost to participate or the cost of the product is incredibly low and the potential or the, the growth opportunities is really high. And those are the things you want to look for when you're looking at products for your library space. You want to make sure that they're affordable, but they also give you countless learning opportunities. There are tons of 3D printers. I would encourage you not to just buy the, the main brand 3D printer that everyone talks about. Uh, take a look at different websites, and they list out tons of 3D printers and what they can do. So here's a comparison between two. I really like Robo 3D, and it prints the exact same quality as the MakerBot. And there's a huge price difference, and more companies are competing in this respect where they're taking an existing product, like an existing 3D, manu 3D printing manufacturer, and figuring out how to make it cheaper, uh, but maintain quality. Uh, this is a dot matrix 3D printer, so it's almost like uh, how an inkjet works, where it sprays, sprays the ink almost, but then you get full, like high definition quality prints, and there's no resin or anything you have to dissolve this in. This is how it looks like when it's done printing. Uh, very, very cool. The price tag isn't. Uh, it's several thousand. I think it's three grand for a form lab printer, which prints the same. Uh, this is called a paper 3D printer, where you take recycled paper, you stick it in the box, and it can print for you in 3D. Uh, the low cost is, I believe, $20,000. So that's crazy expensive. But it's a really cool idea, taking recycled paper and making it into a 3D product. Then there's the other side of the coin, uh, laser cutting. So cutting uh, plastic, cutting wood, cutting cardboard, and making shapes and making uh, products out of that. And so Glowforge is probably like the hot name brand right now that everyone seems to be talking about. They have a pretty decent size uh, collection of different types of printers based off of where you want to get started. And then there's also the uh, 3D Doodler that lets you draw in 3D, and they actually just released the opportunity to uh, make a, a kid-friendly one where the tip is in that's hot. And I think that sells for like $50, which is pretty cheap. It's essentially like a hot glue gun, but you can draw in 3D. In terms of the Maker Universe, there's tons of other products out there uh, from hardware tools to digital tools like recording studios. Uh, or hardware studios where you have screwdrivers, nails, etc. Um, but the concept is that people want to make and people want to create. On the other side of the coin is programmable robots. Uh, there's lots of options out there that let people learn how to program. And the best way to do it, or the most interactive way to do it, is using robots. Because if you ask anybody, do you like robots or not, most people say yes, except like Sarah Connor, uh, which is Terminator reference. So most people like robots, and so this is a really great way to get people to start playing with a robot and then showing them how you can program it and taking things to the next level. So Sphero, an excellent example of a robot where it connects to your phone for, uh, via Bluetooth and you can drive it around. On the other side of the coin, you're able to program it 
make it move on its own. If you do a search for uh, New York City NYC uh, Sphero, they did a holiday dance party with 28 Sphero balls that blinked and moved and danced around all on their own through programming. And they played it to the, they choreographed it to the sounds of a Christmas song. Uh, BB-8, made by the same company of Sphero, but it's a uh, robotic uh, droid from the Star Wars movie. But you can also program this. So this is a really cool trick to get people playing with a robot and then saying, hey, let me show you how you can program it. Ozobot's another awesome robot that you can program simply by drawing. Ozobot reads colors underneath, of, underneath and can trace those colors. And so uh, depending on your color patterns or depending on what color you use, the robot will react differently. If it rides over a blue line, it lights up blue. If it rides over a green line, it lights up green. Uh, and then different dashes and different symbols, or different patterns rather, will make it react differently. So if you did a blue, black, blue in dash, in, in dash format, it will make it go faster. And so by utilizing these techniques, you can get people that are really into drawing and art into also programming by letting them draw with these four colors and then having them trace it with the Ozobot. Dash and Dot is another awesome robot, especially for younger kids because it makes really adorable noises. And so it's like, how do you do? And, and it interacts with the person playing with it. So as they're sending commands, they're getting constant feedback. Uh, which is another really great reason why robots and robot programming is worth an investment. Because uh, when you're learning how to code and you don't have that constant feedback, you don't know if you're doing it right or wrong, and you also don't know whether you like it or not. And so by playing with a robot and sending code instantly and seeing how the robot reacts and responds gives children or adults that instant gratification of, hey, I did something and I got an output. Uh, Finch is a robotic, uh, it's supposed to be a bird. Uh, it looks more like a stingray. But if you hold it on its side, it looks like a bird. Uh, so the finch has a whole bunch of different sensors inside of it that you can program. And so there's wheels that you can make move. There's light sensors, motion sensors, touch sensors. And you can program these all through a tool called Scratch. He has his own variant called Finch, or Snap, sorry, where you drag and drop icons, uh, like an arrow key, that moves forward and you drag and drop the arrow key and it moves forward. Uh, Wink is a programmable bug. It's not out yet, um, but I actually have a couple. So in May, I'm doing a uh, hands-on like workshop that Luis can share more information about. Uh, just look for her emails. So at the end of May, you can play with all this really cool products uh, inside a couple different libraries. So look forward to that email. But Wink has a variety of sensors, motors, and gears that you can program. Uh, so you can make the robot and you can make the robot move. You can have it learn how to trace light. So if you were in a dark room and you shined a flashlight, the robot would follow it. And so the website gives you a whole list of activities and projects you can do, learning how to program different pieces of it. On the other side of the coin is actually building robots. Um, people like to build as well. And the whole Lego mentality where you ask anyone of any age, do you know Legos are or do you still play with Legos? A lot of people will respond with yes, or yes, I have Legos. So Mechanoid uh, is a dancing robot that you can build, and you can also program and send commands to, and it dances. Vex Robotics is similar to Lego Mindstorms, which is an advanced robot where you're putting pieces together, and then using a program, you can then make it move and dance on its own. The thing I like about VEX is it also comes with a remote controller, so you can actually drive it around versus having to program it. And the other thing is if you lose a piece with VEX Robotics, they allow you just to reprint it, uh, whereas LEGO would like sue you to the end of the world if you reprinted any of their pieces. VEX actually has all the schematics posted, and they're like, here you go, lose a piece, print a piece. Uh, Cubelets is another really cool product that lets you build a robot without having to do any type of coding. Each block has its own set of commands and codes already, and by linking these blocks together, you can build an interactive robot. So if you see in the picture, the white blocks are outputs, whether they be a light or a motor, and the black blocks are inputs, whether they be light sensors, motion sensors, sound sensors, and by putting these blocks together, you can build a robot. And then Moss is another robot that you can 
uh, it's twofold. You can build it, and there's preset commands inside of each cube that respond accordingly. So there's one that says, hey, if it sees sound, turn something on. And so if you put these blocks together in a series, you can build a pretty cool interactive robot. On the other side of the coin is you're able to program it via Bluetooth, and you can drive it around, and you can teach it like uh, how to go through a maze. So if it sees an obstacle, how do you tell it to avoid the obstacle? A hummingbird, which is a robotics kit where there's it's a giant kit with a Arduino board and different motors, sensors, and lights. And by using craft materials, you can build like an interactive robot. So in this example, when it sees motion, the Einstein character will move his sign around and it lights up. And it was programmed all through Snap or the Scratch variant. A Cubeto is they're actually having a Kickstarter right now, I believe. Or this is for younger children that teach you how to program without a computer screen. So in the picture, there's that board to the right with the colored cubes on it, the red, blue, and green cubes. Each cube means it's something different. And as you put these together in a series, the Cubeto, which is the character on the left, will then move and drive around. A very neat product. Uh, Marilyn is currently doing a beta test with it, and we're working on doing a beta test in the Chicagoland region as well and seeing how libraries can utilize this product in their spaces. Um, but check them out on their Kickstarter. The other thing that people like to do in makerspaces is playing with circuits, electricity. Uh, everyone loves making things turn on and light up. Looks like it dropped a little. Uh, everyone likes turning things on and making things light up. Little Bits is a really great example of allowing that to happen. Uh, I think somebody once called them the Legos for electronics, where in order to make a circuit, you need three things. You need blue, which is your power, uh, pink or purple, which is your input, and your green, which is your output. And by putting these things together in series, you can make a circuit. A really awesome story uh, that I want to share. So I was in Colorado giving a presentation, and before I started, I was in the lobby, and I was in the hotel lobby playing with uh, little bits and making sure they all worked and testing them out. Uh, a family came by with two little girls who wanted to know what I was doing and what all this stuff was. So I explained, oh, this, this is like maker technology. These are little bits, and you can make things light up. In about five or ten minutes, the two girls were all, like, zoned in and playing with little bits. Uh, and the parents were like, what is this magic? This never happens. Our kids aren't quiet like this, and they don't play uh, silently together. I'm like, oh, this is little bits. And I explained kind of the concept behind it and what it does. And they were fascinated by this. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the younger one couldn't figure out why her circuit wasn't working. And so the older one then stopped what she was doing and helped her sister solve the problem. At this point, her parents were like floored, and they're like, all right, where do we buy these? Because they don't get along. Like, it's like they were uh, like 7 and 10, so I guess that's the ripe fighting age. Uh, and so I told her, hey, check out your local library. They might have this, uh, which was followed up by, no, I don't think so. Our library just has books. And so then that led into a whole discussion of libraries have computers and internet access. Uh, and they're like, what? I can go to the library and get free Wi-Fi. And so there's this conversation that we're missing, and, and I encourage you to look into some of the maker tech and bring that in to bring patrons in. Uh, because some of them haven't been in the library in so long, they don't know what you're doing. And so I encourage you to kind of do outreach and bring people together using maker technology. Um, Light Up is another product that allows you to build a circuit like Snap Circuits, except you can take a picture of it, and it'll tell you if you built the circuit right or wrong and how to fix it. And then Circuit Scrub is a, there's a pen, and it's apparently non-toxic, not going to test it, but you can draw your own circuits, and using diodes, you can place these little circuit boards or circuits you draw and make things light up. So what some libraries have done was they've done storytelling with Circuit Scribe where they will draw out a story and cut out the characters and place the characters on top of the colored bits. And then, and then since the paper is almost see-through, uh, the kids would put the characters down on the page and they would light up. Uh, Makey Makey is an open source controller. So if you programmed a game, for instance, in Scratch, or you wanted to play Mario uh, or Tetris, you can then hook up everyday objects to this controller and use those everyday objects as your input. 
So what one library did, so if you can see the little arrow keys, uh, the up arrow key, in order, they used up Play-Doh, and they ran a long wire for one side of the building with the Play-Doh for the up arrow, and the other side of the building had the down arrow, or I should say room. And the way they played, so the kids had to link arms and run back and forth in order to play Tetris uh, and using Makey Makey. In terms of circuit boards, there's a lot of opportunities out there to kind of get involved and start learning about breadboarding, soldering, and how Arduino boards work. Uh, some people have actually already developed uh, really cool products outside of using lily pad and computer boards. So somebody made a jacket that you can put on, and when you're walking in, let's say, like downtown Chicago, instead of looking at your phone for directions, your jacket will vibrate. Uh, it'll vibrate your left shoulder when it's time to turn left, and vibrate your right shoulder when it's time to turn right. And so people are doing all these really cool things using programming and open source code. In terms of other inputs, a lot of companies now are trying to blend physical and digital play together. Tiggly is a really great example of that movement, where, there have, where there's colorized shapes, and that when you place down on the tablet, the tablet will read those shapes. So you can play games such as spelling, counting, or shapes. Osmo is really awesome in terms of blending digital and physical play together. There is a camera essentially on the top of your iPad, and this the red piece clips on, on top of it, and it makes a mirror. Then it shines down to where your hands are. So you can play games with the tangrams uh, and create characters and shapes. You can do a, a drawing game where you can trace an object and draw it. You can play another game, uh, which is being displayed on the screen, called Newton. So it'll drop balls from the top of the screen, and when you draw a line on the page, the ball will bounce off to it. There's also spelling and counting uh, and, doing, and doing math as well. Uh, and then in terms of coding, I have a big excitement when giving people more into coding. And I joke when I say I don't want to code anymore. Uh, coding is huge, and I, I always say it's the gateway to the future because if you look at the last 10 to 15 years, uh, there's no, there hasn't been any big technology jumps. And it's funny saying this on a webinar called Innovative Technology, but the core difference between what we had 10 to 15 years ago and what we have today is how it's programmed and how it interacts. If you're looking at your cell phone going, Brian, my cell phone's pretty cool, we've had all that technology for 10 to 15 years. We have had better cameras than what we're putting on our phones 10 to 15 years ago. So when the new iPhone 7 comes out, they had that stuff for 10 to 15 years. And it's just taking a really smart programmer and some engineers putting things together to make them work better. Uh, then you'll say, Brian, well, what about self-driving cars? Fine. We've had all those types of sensors. We had GPS, motion sensors, collision sensors, uh, temperature sensors, et cetera, for hundreds of for, for 10, 15 years. Uh, if you want to talk about home automation, same thing. It's just a really sharp programmer and engineers coming together and figuring out ways we can get products to talk to each other. So with that being said, there's lots of opportunities out there for to get involved into coding. Girls Who Code is a fantastic organization that oftentimes will run a free program for your library space, specifically for girls to get them into coding. Uh, Code Academy is another great resource. Code.org will also sometimes run free programs for library spaces to get people into coding. Uh, and they have a whole bunch of really awesome resources on their website to help jumpstart a program uh, that you don't, even, you don't have to be a programmer for. Uh, and then in terms of teaching kids to program, one of my favorite apps is called Hopscotch. It's a free app that you just drag and drop commands to, and you hit play, and your characters play. People have made game, like a food fight game out of this. People have, and these are kids when I'm saying people, like 10 years old, are creating a, 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 the Frogger game or recreating Flappy Bird. They're doing this all through Hopscotch without... Struggle. Well, there's some struggles, but without any huge roadblocks because they're able to keep on playing and keep on interacting. Uh, this is what kind of Scratch looks like. So Finch, the Hummingbird, uh, a lot of other companies now are going to this model where you can drag and drop preset blocks and program something through it. There's also subscription kits out there trying to get more people into the making environment. Bitsbox is a really great company that is a subscription-based company that allows you to build a game on your com game on a computer, scan it with your smart device, and then play it on your smart device. And they do inside your kit is a little booklet, 
with a theme. And so there's a dinosaur theme. There's been a uh, robotics theme. There's been like a cooking thing with actual recipes inside of it. Uh, if you would like, I actually have a whole bunch of kits in my garage that are designed for an hour of code. So it's a poster and then a whole bunch of pamphlets that you can hand out to your patrons. Uh, and you do basically, it's like an hour of code. You go through the pamphlet and you build a couple of games. If you're interested, definitely email me. My email is at the uh, end of the webinar. Uh, so just make a note if you like one. Uh, Tinker Crate is another cool company that's a subscription base where every month for about $20 you can get a kit and you can build something out of it. And it's usually uh, like a wood based kit uh, with some levers and motors. So why have all this stuff in your library? Uh, first of all, you can provide a safe to fail environment. Uh, in school, especially for younger patrons, you can't take a risk on something. You can't fail in a classroom. You can't try something new in hopes you get it. Because if you fail, then you fa then it's bad. And so in a library space, you can allow that opportunity to struggle and play without risk of damaging their grades. And so it's a really great opportunity to involve people. It's also a gateway to new ideas. You can spark interest into fields that ordinarily they might not have been exposed to. Uh, there's a really great story of a, a librarian. He's a, a joint use library, and he had a High schooler come up to him and say, hey, I don't know what I want to do when I get to college. Said, no clue. And so what he did was he sat down with him and says, here, check out this Arduino board. I think you like computers. Played with it. He turned it after about a day or two and says, no, I don't get it. So then he checked out little bits uh, and started building circuits and got really involved. Uh, three weeks later, he came back and checked out Arduino board, the Arduino board again. Uh, the gentleman is now going into robotical engineering all because the library provided him an opportunity to play with something that he might not ordinarily have been exposed to. It's also a great way to provide new tools and resources. We've been doing this for, for countless generations. We're incredibly good at it, uh, showing new products or new books and providing these materials to people. We're, we're experts at it. Uh, we have to continue doing that through this maker movement. And the last thing I always like to hypothesize is what if we, as a library, launch the next big entrepreneurial startup? What if we made the next MySpace? Because MySpace has to make a comeback sooner or later. Or what if we made the next Tesla car? There's all these opportunities that we can cultivate in our library space. And then the big question becomes, what happens if that library needs funding 10 to 15 years down the road? Who do they ask first? They ask that multi-billion dollar company that they help foster and they help grow because they provided those resources. They provided the gateway to ideas. They allowed them to fail and struggle in the library space. You ask that CEO of that company if they can help you. If they can help you and they will. So are there any questions right now? Uh, hi, Brian. No, we don't have any questions just yet. So. Uh, it's been really interesting to see everything so far. So um, I'll just put a shout out to everyone. If you have questions for Brian, please go ahead and type those into your questions box at any time, and we'll try to answer as many as possible before we finish up. So thanks, Brian. And I know I do talk fast. So if you just ping, uh, ping Louise, then she'll ping me, and I'll, I can try to dial it back. Uh, there's just a lot of content I want to get through for you. Uh, and keep in mind, too, that the slides will be shared. And, and whatnot. Uh, home automation is probably one of the biggest talks that I'm hearing about from the technology world and how we can make our home into a smart home, uh, get our own Jarvis system, if you will, like from Iron Man. So there's fridges out there that you can buy today that can detect what kind of foods you have and then send that data to the stove. So if you're at, if you're leaving. If you're about to leave work and you go, oh no, what am I gonna make today? You can send a message to your fridge. It'll detect what you have. Go, all right, we're gonna make, I think the example is sweet potato pizza, which I don't know if I'd eat. And then it sends it to the stove, so the stove starts to warm up. So by the time you get home, your stove's ready, you mix your material, and you're good to go. The picture at the top is uh, from Whirlpool, actually, and they have a prototype that's not real because uh, I got in trouble for filming it. But it's essentially a, uh, a countertop that when you put down a pot or a pan, it detects if it's a pot or pan and heats up just that section. 
So everywhere else on your countertop is, is safe. So you can reply to messages, you can look up recipes, and it knows the difference between your finger and an actual pan. And so I think they've actually kind of narrowed down how they're going to build this, um, but it was more of a proof of concept at CES last year. Um, and they made me actually delete the video I took of it. It was really weird. So, but yeah, that's kind of where we're looking for home automation in the kitchen. Home automation in the home is, has endless possibilities. Uh, people are able to control more and more of their house, everything from opening and closing blinds to opening and closing garage doors to turning on lights, changing the mood, uh, etc. At CES, they've actually, a couple companies built giant houses as their exhibit space that you would walk to and interact with the entire smart home. Very, very awesome. The Wink Hub and the Wink, so the way smart homes work or smart home automation is usually all the devices have to talk to some type of hub or some type of relay. Um, and there's a variety of products out there. Wink is one of my favorite ones, and it's the one I ended up using uh, that connects to the majority of the devices that I like. Uh, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Smart Things is made by Samsung. Uh, they have their own version of the hub and the products that connect to it. The tricky thing when talking about home automation or if you want to make a smart home is not all products talk to each other. So when you're looking at, oh, I really like this doorbell or this door lock, but it doesn't talk to my hub, you're going to get that a lot. And so there's a lot of pre-planning that needs to take place. So what I encourage you to do is make a list of what you want automated in your house, find different products, and then find out which hub kind of handles the most. And so that's the one issue in the smart home arena is that manufacturers don't necessarily want to be able to talk to other manufacturers because then it's a competing business. And so they want to be the ones that make an entire suite of uh, home automated devices for your home. That being said, Wemo is probably the most diverse collection. They have everything from uh, crock pots to refrigerators to heat uh, heaters to outlets to light switches. Uh, they have a whole slew of devices that all that all talk to each other and all interact. Nest is another great one. Uh, Nest is its own little family, but they connect to Wink, and they I believe they now connect to Smart Things. Um, but there's a thermostat, smoke detectors, and cameras that you can put into your library space or into your house. Uh, if you're interested in cooking, there's the Neo Smart Jar that you would. It doesn't sense what's inside. You have to tell it what's inside. So you would open up the app and say, I'm putting rice in my jar. And it would tell you, uh, if you how much you have. Like if you're out at the grocery store, and like, oh, no, what do I have in my cupboard? You can pull up the app and see what's in there. There's even smart, waddle, smart waddle, water bottles. Uh, Thermos actually has a really great product that actually syncs with your Fitbit account. So if you have a Fitbit, it can actually talk to it and let you know if you're drinking enough water. Uh, a new one that just came out, and I'm going to pronounce the name wrong, Moikit. Uh, there's a, it's an LCD type screen on the top of the lid, so you can tap it, and it'll tell you your water temperature. It'll vibrate if you haven't drinking water and like your water intake intervals. Uh, and it just came out. I think it just finished its kickstarting fundraiser uh, in February. If you're like, you know, Brian, I don't need anything from my inside of my home. I want stuff outside my home. Droplet is your choice for you. Uh, Droplet, what it does is it syncs up with weather data, and it'll let you, it'll know when to uh, water your yard based on current weather conditions, future weather conditions, how hot it's been, how dry it's been. And it also points and shoots. So if you tell it, hey, all right, I have a plot, pot over here and a garden over here, I need you just to water those two things. It learns, and it'll keep those things hydrated. If you're like, you know what, I really like my windows to stay clean. Uh, they have robots similar to Roomba, but they go up and down windows. I wanted to ask when I was, saw this exhibit, what happens if the power goes out? And long story short, don't try to interact with an exhibit that's not supposed to be interactive, because I wanted to unplug it to see what would happen. Um, but I got that. Uh, Grillbot. So if you're like, you know what, 
that's not enough for me. I like my grill to stay clean. I think this thing's like 90 bucks though. Uh, you can buy a Grillbot, which is a motorized robot you place on your grill and it cleans it for you. So the amount of automation and the amount of robots doing things for us is, is, is kind of scary, but at the same time, really awesome. In terms of home security, there's the August lock. So you can give people an app that when you walk up to your door, it just unlocks for you because it knows who you are. Uh, what's really cool with August that I like is it actually just overlays your deadbolt. So you don't have to take out the whole entire door jam. You just take off the deadbolt, you place the August on top of it, and you have a smart lock. Uh, in other home security, Arlo is a completely wireless camera, as in you don't have to plug it in, it's uh, rechargeable batteries. And you can place these all over your library space, all over your house, and you get real-time security alerts. And the cost of this is relatively cheap. It's like $400 for a set of three cameras and a uh, the hub for it. Lots and lots of security options. There's the Goji smart, uh, smart door lock that welcomes you when you come up to it. There's the ring doorbell, which I ended up getting, and I think it's the coolest thing in the world, watching people struggle with it. Uh, so like my UPS guy finally found out how to ring the doorbell because he would only, he would push the camera. So what would happen is if somebody comes up to my door and I'm not home, they can ring the doorbell. I get to call my cell phone and I can video chat. They can't see me, but I can see them video chat with them. Uh, and so that's how I've deterred uh, the door-to-door -door salespeople uh, and frightened kids on Halloween. And so I also get motion alerts and things like that. Very cool. And then uh, Canary is a really neat home security product that detects if people are home and sends you alerts and checks your uh, weather temperature, your air quality. And the thing I like about Canary is you can teach it uh, how to notify you. So if it, you, have, you have a dog, so I have a dog and a cat, and I've taught it to know the difference between a dog and a cat and a person because you tag what's going on in your canary. So on the app, you go, oh, this is my dog. That's why it set off the movement. So now it mutes pet movement for me and tags it as pet movement automatically. Uh, Piper is another company that competes with Canary. Same type of idea. It's a camera, it's a sensor, and it provides you real-time feedback to your devices. So in terms of smart homes, I think it's a really neat avenue to explore and experiment with. So that's something that I'm working on in my house is actually making it just the main level because it's way too expensive to do the whole house um, and making it entirely smart and, automa and automated. So when I come home, the door unlocks, the lights turn on, and I don't have to do anything. Or if I open my garage door, I can do it through my app or senses my car coming up, it'll open the garage door and turn on my driveway lights. And it's actually, to do kind of those simple things, it's not that expensive to get started and play with. Uh, but what's it mean for libraries? You start building a more energy efficient library in terms of heating and cooling. If you have a whole bunch of nests and sync those up correctly, you can actually have rooms uh, warm up or cool down based on outside temperature, if there's people in the room, et cetera. Uh, or lighting and dimming of lights. Turn off lights if there's no one in the area. Uh, their motion sensors are relatively pricey so if you get a Nest camera, for instance, and sync it up to a light switch, you can kill two birds with one stone. You have a security camera as well as the uh, motion sensor to trigger on your lights. Speaking of lights, you can start building a more interactive library where you can light up specific sections of the library in different colors when patrons walk by. Uh, on the other side of coin, you can build a more secure library using, utilizing those locks, cameras, and motion sensors. Your room reservation system, if you have like study rooms, get a couple August locks and be really innovative about it and send people that have room reservations a text that launches like a unique code. So that patron can then just walk up to the room. They don't have to get a key because they got the reservation on their phone. On the other side, you can do a more data-driven library. You can start building analytics based on movements in your library space. Does one area of the library get more use than the other? You know, you calculate your motion alerts, your motion triggers. Um, how many patrons enter your door? There's a lot of possibilities and options that you can use if you start looking down the home automation path. The other thing that I think is kind of neat is how we can do our merchandising. So GE is, it's not, officially released yet, I believe. But GE is working on a light 
location-based service. So using your phone, uh, it can detect uh, the kind of light that's being emitted. And using, utilizing light and Bluetooth, it can send you commands and information about sales or whatever is over in that area. Uh, so wouldn't that be neat to do that in our library? Like, hey, this is a new book section. Uh, and they can get a roadmap just using their phone. Are there any questions on the automated home or the connected home? Uh, hi, Brian. Yes, we do have a couple questions. Cool. Um, for the Arlo camera, can that be used outside, like in the rain? Yeah, it's weatherproof. Okay, great. And, and then the other question was, is it easy to move or reset smart home devices if you decide it doesn't work in a certain room or certain area? So some devices have to talk to a hub or a relay, and they won't talk to your wireless. Um, and we'll talk about how things connect in a little bit, but it's called, there's a Z-Wave, which, is, which isn't as, the radius for connection isn't as large as your Wi-Fi network. So Z-Wave devices will have to connect to a hub, and that hub connects to your internet. So worst case scenario, you just have to get a second hub for the other side of the house. Um, but moving them around your home is really easy. Uh, you just tell the app, hey, this is now called living room instead of bedroom. And so, I don't know, does that answer the question? Um, well, if, if that did not answer the person's question, they can chime in. <laughs> um, uh -huh. I have a couple of questions back on Makerspaces. Do you want to talk about those now or, yeah, or at the end? We can talk about them now. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for Maker tools that would work in an academic library? Uh, a lot of the tools that work in a public, I always say, can work in an academic. Uh, just because there's still that learning out outcomes, and so if you go to any of those web, any of the products websites, they actually have curriculum pre-built. And what you would do is basically take the curriculum, work with an, work with the teachers, and say, hey, how can we blend these things together, and utilize the library space to kind of take your education to the next level for the students. Uh, and so, so check out the websites, download those curriculums, and then you can kind of leverage pre-built information and put it on top of what teachers have developed, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. And then do you have any suggestions on how to reach middle school and high schoolers to get them interested in these types of programs? Uh, my favorite example is taking this Fero ball, because it's, it's a cute little ball, and taking it into your elementary school or your junior high and driving it around. Uh, zip it into a classroom. I know a lot of libraries do outreach. And one of the things I see uh, disconnect in is kids don't always uh, like to recall that information because they're kind of interrupting their day. And so, and that's like that whole psychologic, psychology thing behind it. So if you use the ball, drive it into the room, and allow the, the, the children to go, oh, hey, what is that? Uh, they're essentially engaging you in conversation, quote, unquote, giving you permission to talk to them. And they're going to retain that information a lot better. And so kind of to recap, bring in some of the stuff and let them ask questions, let them come to you, and then they're going to retain everything a lot better versus you trying to pitch to them, if that makes sense. That's a great idea. I've seen that Spiro ball in action. That's a lot of fun. So, mm -hmm. um, And then one last question for right now, going back to the home devices. Um, okay. what, brand do you, what brand do you use on the garage door? I use Chamberlain. Chamberlain. Uh, so okay. Chamberlain has a uh, smart home garage door opener. Uh, I actually got it for free when I got my new garage door, and so then that kind of jump started me. I'm like, you know what? Might as well do the whole house. Um, I think it's like a hundred dollar add-on uh, if you bought it on Amazon. I'm not entirely sure, so don't quote me on it, but it's not too terrible. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have for right now. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So you're welcome. So I'm going to zip through the wearables. Because uh, I think we're like halfway done. So lots of options to wear things uh, on your wrists, on your head, on your hands, etc. cetera. Uh, Fitbit is probably the most widely known health wristband that can give you your heart rate, tell you the time. The new Fitbit Blaze, it's really nice. Uh, you can actually see text messages off of it, very similar to the Apple Watch or the Samsung uh, Watch. Muse. It's an EKG headband, and you would put this headband over your head, and you could do brain exercises, and it somehow reads how you're thinking, and it gives you 
activities you can do to help improve memory, help improve thought process. Don't know the science behind it, uh, but it's a pretty neat product. A lot of people now are into life logging or taking photos of everything. Um, and said that these are less selfie driven and more uh, what you're looking at. So Memento, MeCam, Autographer, there's hundreds of them out there now that you clip onto your shirt and it takes constant photos at intervals you preset. Uh, you can have these, these usually will sync to your phone and your phone decides whether or not to sync them to the cloud or sync them to the phone's memory. GoPros is probably the more popular action camera, uh, very durable. And you can, you know, take these into water, you can go skydiving with these, and they can take a pretty good beating. Um, the whole idea of life logging, I would like to think, started from GoPros. Apple Watch, uh, I have one. I really like it. Uh, if you want to save money, buy it on eBay. People buy these, and then they can't return them, so then you get, like, $300 off, uh, which is what I did, because I can't, I'm not going to spend that much on a, on a watch. So check out eBay and get things that way. Uh, Samsung, another great product that, you know, very similar to Apple. Uh, Apple and Samsung can sync to your smart devices and send you the messages that you're receiving. You can reply to them. You can see your calendar and it'll vibrate. Uh, you can take and place calls from it. Um, and so a lot of really cool, like James Bondy uh, type of gear is out there. Uh, Pebble is another really great product that kind of accomplishes the same thing, um, but has that more like stylish look to it. Recon Jet is the Google Glasses 2.0, if you will, uh, where they're a lot more stylish. It's made by a company called Recon. And what this one does, similar to Google Glasses, gives you the head up, heads up display. But this was designed for active people. So if you're playing tennis, if you're going snowboarding, uh, it can give you real time uh, outputs of you know, how fast the ball's moving or what altitude you're at uh, for tennis or snowboarding. If that wasn't enough, you, and you wanted to rub a product all over your face instead of wearing it, that's Oku. Uh, Oku can read your skin type and tell you if you need more moisturizer, less moisturizer, sunscreen, et cetera, and it syncs up with weather data. So it says, hey, it's going to be sunny today. Put extra suntan lotion on because your skin requires this much. Uh, I think it's kind of weird. I don't know how I feel about rubbing a piece of plastic all over my face, but that's Oku, your personal skin coach. Uh, Myo Armband, it's an armband that you would put over your arm that reads muscle movement uh, via like an EKG. And so if you did sign language, for instance, Myo would translate your, your muscle movement to your computer and present you that data, uh, what, you're, what, you're, what you're saying with your hands. Uh, you can move the Sphero ball with a Myo Armband. You can move PowerPoint slides by clicking your fingers together. So there's a lot of really cool applications, and this is more like gesture-based computing. Linksits, it's an anti-bullying wearable where people can get these little products and they're tradable, and it's designed for younger kids that will allow them to be friends, essentially. So you can trade pieces. If you're, if you're feeling upset about something, you press one piece, and your connected buddies will know what's going on. And so it's a really cool ecosystem. It's not out yet. Um, but I met the lady a couple of years ago as uh, she was developing this. It's a very cool idea. And if you're like, you know what? I need something for my kid. I have enough wearables. There's a whole bunch out there as well. Uh, Mimo Baby, it's a, like a onesie that you can put on, and it detects if your child or your baby is sleeping right, if they're awake, if they're crying, what their temperature is, et cetera. They even have binkies now that have like computer chips inside that can tell you temperature and if they're feeling well or not. If that wasn't enough, and you're like, I really need to get some wearables for my dog, you can get voice. Uh, voice t is very similar to, I guess, like a Fitbit almost, where it tracks uh, how much movement your dog is doing. But what's really neat is over time, it can detect trends and alert you if there might be a problem. So if your dog isn't as active anymore, it'll detect that. And they're like, hey, your dog's been breathing heavy, its heart rate's been up, and it hasn't been moving a lot, it might have this going on. Take it to a vet. And so they, there's some um, science behind it, which I liked. If that still isn't enough for you, and you're like, you know what? I also don't want to wear stuff. I want it all over everything. Uh, Aurora by WeThings, it's a uh, sleep sensor that you put under your mattress, and it tells you if you're sleeping right, uh, what, 
and how to improve it. So it can detect ambient noise, detects ambient lights, and they'll let you know, hey, you had a lot of noise going on last night, and look, you didn't sleep very well. Sense does the same idea. Uh, this one clips onto your pillow instead, and it keeps track. The thing I like about both of these products, maybe more so uh, Aurora, because that's one that I, I ended up getting, is Aurora has this LED little light, and they say there's a science that says when you go to sleep, you need a certain kind of light emitting, which is a red light that helps you calm, and it does something with your body's enzymes to help you relax and rest. Then in the morning, it's a cool blue light, if I recall. I didn't stop using it because I didn't like it. Uh, a cool blue light that helps you wake up uh, in a nice way, and it detects your end of your REM sleep cycle, and so you don't wake up in the middle of REM sleep. And so it says it gives you like a half hour window and you figure out the best time through it. Uh, with all this data, and we're going to get into big data in a little bit, uh, there's a lot of data about ourselves being logged and being shared. And this is what that big data and data curation is all about. Uh, I have a couple slides more to kind of dig into it. But essentially, somebody once said that we're at the point now where children have a digital identity before they're born. And it took me a while to put it together, but they were talking about uh, ultrasounds because people take photos of their ultrasounds and post it on Facebook. And so that person has an identity, a digital identity, before they're even born. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's deep. Uh, so just something to kind of consider and think about. And a lot of it's done by our own doing, too. Uh, everything from checking in, tweeting, Facebooking, wearable technology, doc directors being online, you know, our credit accounts, online storage, we're putting so much of ourselves out on the internet. The other side is more about personalized computers, because uh, with all that personalized data, people want to have their own personalized devices, and computers now are being very personal, per, driven for individuals and driven for individual success. And so then the question becomes, you know, what about public computers? Do people want to use public computers because they're no longer their non-personalized individual uh, because they don't have the apps that they like or they don't have the the buttons on their home page or they have to re-log into all their websites that they use uh, so just something to consider you know what if what if this personal identity comes to full tilt where everyone has to have their own device and the cost of devices has come down so much um, what does that mean for us so just something to kind of consider and other impacts, uh, they talk about disconnecting versus connecting. So is it more like everyone is based on their devices and not communicating, or are they using devices to communicate more? Uh, in other words, the question is, is technology taking us apart or bringing us together? Don't have time to play this video, but if you search for Microsoft Pro Productivity Future Vision, search for the 2011 vision. It's my favorite. I put the link at the bottom watch it and it talks about how technology actually can bring people together if it's done right um, and a lot of the stuff that Microsoft shows are things that they're working on and so you can kind of get a glimpse into the future by watching that the last piece is training um, we're in a really good position to start training our patrons of the new technology we also need to educate them on safe use with the increase of hacking uh, and the decrease in proper computer safety training uh, there's a lot of real threats out there and how do we overcome those threats uh, I'm going to continue on, and then we'll jump to questions if that's all right. Uh, in terms of interactivity in spaces, there's touch-based and gesture-based. In terms of touch-based, people want to touch and interact with everything. Uh, smart, smart table is one of my favorite examples of Microsoft Pixel Sense, where there are giant tables where groups of people can come together and play and interact. Another real cool product, uh, LG actually has this in one of their stores. It's a giant touchscreen display that people can come up to and interact and draw and play on. And there's also gesture-based, where people want to communicate with technology without using their hands. There's a tons of, tons of sites to explore and check out. So the idea of this minority report being real is actually possible, and people are able to make these things happen. Uh, this is Microsoft Connects on the left, Leap Motions on the right. You connect these to machines and interact with your computer just by moving your hands. You can also make your everyday objects into touch-driven objects. So TouchJet is a really cool product that will take any normal TV and make it into a smart TV, a touchscreen TV rather, where you can touch the screen and interact with it. 
or touch pond or touch jet pond, uh, it's a reverse projector that you can't connect anything to. It's an Arduino projector. And so you can install like, Arduino apps or, or sorry, Arduino, Google, Google apps and Android, and you can load like Angry Birds, et cetera, using the Google Play Store. The other side is interactive spaces. So this is a projector in the ceiling with multiple cameras and kids can come together and kick a digital soccer ball into the net. You can text a fish at the Carnival Cruise storefront window, see the fish, and make the fish move around. Uh, University of Dayton, Ohio has an interactive mural that when multiple people come up to the mural, these little cubes spin around and they show pictures and videos of campus life. Carolina Sabetka has an, makes a whole bunch of interactive art and one of her art projects was a dog at a storefront window. So if you were to kneel down and pretend you gave the dog a treat, the dog would look for it. If you stood up and threw a ball, pretend you threw a ball, the dog would disappear to get the ball. Uh, when you approach the storefront window initially, the dog will bark, jump up and down, and chase you side to side. This is an interactive rainforest. It was, I believe it was in New York last. Essentially what it is, it's a series of projectors that when kids interrupt the flow of water, by standing in front of it or using a log, which is at the bottom left, they divert the streams to the wall. And when it hits the wall, a tree grows. And then lastly, Toby, uh, which is almost like gesture-based computing, except you use your eyes to move the mouse. So simply by looking at your screen, it detects your eyes and knows what you're looking at. I had a terrible headache trying to figure out how to make that work because I had to think about moving my eyes. And you're supposed to just look, but I don't look that way. And then in terms of interaction in your spaces, there's a lot of stuff about robots out there, where robots are doing our chores or helping us communicate or, or playing with us. Uh, there's actually one robot that's currently on kick, you know, Indiegogo right now called IDO, which is on the one on the right, that is also smart home compatible. So you say, IDO, can you turn on the lights for me? Or IDO can also recognize people's faces. So if somebody rings the doorbell, it'll come up, it'll identify who it is, and then also escort them to where you're at. Uh, Buddy is another one. I think that one finished its Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign a while ago, but they're still working on it with a, I think, the December 2016 release date. But check these, thing, think, check these two things out. They both have projector options where they can project a screen to a wall. That's an interactive screen, and you can, you know, touch it and interact with it, which then comes into, you know, can we automate our circulation desk? Or can we automate our circulation clerk with a robot that interacts and talks to you? Uh, and follows you around and asks you questions. Uh, the robot on the left actually started following me around at CES, and I was really scared because I didn't know it was also remote controlled. So, flood story. Uh, and then self-driving cars is the other thing that people talk about in terms of interaction, uh, that people are building self-driving cars and, and they're working fairly well. There was an accident actually that they said that occurred in with a Google self-driving car uh, but it turned out that uh, it was actually user error that caused the accident, allegedly. Um, but self-driving cars has a whole myriad of sensors and uh, brake sensors and motion sensors and light sensors, radar sensors, video cameras, et cetera, that detect how things are moving and how they respond. All right, are there any questions on, on that? Hi, Brian. I've got uh, two quick questions. Um, why did you not like the Aura sleeping device? I didn't like the alarm. So I like it, but I don't like the alarm function. Um, because, so in order to stop the alarm, you have to double tap the top of the alarm. And like, I'm not fully functioning that way in the morning. I can't slap alarm clocks. And so I kept on knocking mine over. Uh, and also, I didn't care for the, the light. It's supposed to help you re-energize in the morning, but I just, I don't, personally, I like it to still kind of be dark when I wake up. Gotcha. Um, so, okay. But it works for people you know, that, that want to try that science of, uh, I can't think of the fancy name, it's like light therapy. Um, but it works incredibly well, and it actually did wake me up in the middle of, or at the end of my REM sleep cycles, because uh, I know that I would lay in bed for a little bit, and then the alarm would uh, actually sound. So I want that's kind of neat. Okay. And then uh, what was the product name for uh, the device that turned a TV into a touchscreen? 
Uh, that's called Touch Jet. Touch Jet. Okay. Yep. All right. That's all the questions we have for right now. Perfect. So now we're going to jump into connectivity and briefly talk about how devices are connecting to each other and how they communicate. So Bluetooth is probably the most wild, wildly now and most popular. Uh, it allows you to send data to and from devices, your Fitbits, most of your smart gear connects via Bluetooth. And then you can control those devices remotely through Bluetooth, or you can control your device remotely through Bluetooth. RFID, uh, which stands for Radio Frequency Identification, uh, it's like little chips that can contain any kind of data. They can be product information, they can be credit card information, they can be uh, temperature, and they can actually, some of them actually give a readout of what's going on. And then when you scan it, it can give you that readout, which is kind of neat. Uh, some use batteries, and other ones actually use uh, what's called electromagnetic energy, just, just energy around it to stay charged. Um, there are some concerns with it. Uh, they're, very, they're very small and easy enough to be planted without anyone noticing. And the other question is, how easy is it to access the data? Um, there hasn't been, or at least I haven't come across a lot of studies of people hacking RFIDs, but it, you know, you can do, read it without a direct line of sight, which makes it kind of scary. So who is reading your data? NFC is near field communication, uh, which is typically with smartphones or business cards where you can scan things in almost, they have to be in contact or very close proximity to transfer information, whether that's credit card info, or it's uh, like contact info, photos, et cetera. Uh, very similar to how RFID works, except you have to be very, very close. So it's a little bit more secure. They also say, you know, if you're walking in a, in a crowded street, how easy is it for someone with a NFC reader just to bump into random people and collect data where their NFC is on? Uh, iBeacon is another thing that people are talking about, um, which is like the variant of NFC, except it's more it pings wirelessly, uh, which is kind of neat. So people are doing, oh, I don't have it lined up, uh, where people are building, uh, one library is putting together an iBeacon setup where based off of what room you're in, and you have to have the app, uh, you'll get notifications like, hey, you're in this room, and this is what's going on, or this section of the building, this is what's going on. And they can get all these real-time alerts via iBeacon based off of uh, location in the building. Uh, and then in terms of wireless, most home devices don't connect via wireless except like a hub or the Nest product. Uh, but the thing is with wireless now is we're actually at the point where our wireless networks are faster than our typical LAN networks, where it's actually quicker and you get better speeds when you're on Wi-Fi. Uh, Z-Wave is the communication standard for home automation devices. Uh, it used to be people were using Zigbee, which is another type of uh, communication relay that devices can talk to, except Zigbee devices aren't necessarily cross-manufacturer compatible, meaning uh, manufacturer A, if they're using Zigbee, might program it differently in how they talk, so it can't program or can't speak with a different manufacturer's product. Whereas Z-Wave is a standardized platform uh, where the devices can read each other and talk to each other, uh, kind of like the way Z-Wave works, it builds like a wireless mesh network where every device is a relay. So it'll send a command out to one, and it catches it and sends it out to the next one. Uh, in terms of RFID, this is kind of where you can implement it, where you can tag and book drop and, and find out how people are moving through your library. Um, other people are finding are using RFID and NFC and iBeacon to track movement in the library space to find out how people browse and then redate that data and figure out the best way to lay out the collection. And then in terms of big data and data curation, kind of briefly talked about it where with our smart devices and our wearables, we're constantly sharing information about ourselves to the, on the internet. We're posting it. Um, well, it's really useful, even though it's scary. So the whole risk and rewards idea, uh, the reward is you can identify trends of your health. You can go, hey, you know what? I haven't been feeling too well. I haven't been sleeping well because Aurora told me so. I haven't been exercising as well because Fitbit told me so. I haven't been drinking as much because my water bottle told me so. So what does that mean? Uh, so companies are trying to figure out ways to plug into that data to give you health tips or how to kind of better your life. 
and then it also saves time and energy because with all this data being collected about us, we can start increasing efficiency. So I no longer have to turn on light switches when I come home. I can have it, hey, when I come home, just turn everything on for me so I don't have to. And when I leave, turn it off so I don't have to. I'll save a few seconds, um, but over time I can save hours. And so let's talk about big data and data creation is kind of what's happening with all this data and where's it going. Uh, the alarming, I guess, information about data is how data has changed over the years. Uh, we used to have to have giant rooms set together to store a few megabytes of data. Uh, then it became a disk, and then it became CDs, and now we're storing terabytes of data on itty-bitty drives. Um, they say that within the last two years, we've actually collected 90% of all the data in the world has been generated over those last two years because how we're increasing our data usage and what we're collecting. And as we add more wearables and as we add more home automated devices, we're adding more and more data onto the interweb so Skynet can take over. That's a joke. I'm not that worried about that. Uh, and then concerns. So what happens with this data? What happens if your Fitbit account or Fitbit gets bought by Blue Cross Blue Shield? What does that mean to all your Fitbit data? Can then Blue Cross Blue Shield go, hey, we're going to change your insurance rates because we saw that you're not very active on Fitbit, which would stink for me. Uh, so what happens with that? What happens if those companies change or they, or they merge and they blend? Uh, and then in other terms of hackers, um, hackers choose points of contact or, or targets based on what kind of data they have. So if one company collects, starts collecting all this data, if I was a hacker, I would choose that company because it has the most data for you know, my effort. So just some concerns to think about. You know, so when you're looking at wearables and home automation, I encourage you to kind of look into the security behind it and how they secure their networks because uh, that might be useful. When you're installing apps, it also asks for permissions for your phone. Uh, they want to know it's your location when you're using it. They want to see your contact info. So there's all this connect, interconnectionness that's going on. And whether or not that's a good thing, it's up to you. For me, I understand the risk for it. So, and I understand the reward. And I think the reward outweighs the risk. Sure, someone might steal my, my health data. But at the end of the day, I don't care. Because they're going to be like, well, that guy doesn't do much. And I openly admit that. So I guess it's entirely up to you and how you want to spin that. Uh, are there any questions on the how data works or how connectivity works? Um, we just had one question um, about if you've seen anything about charging devices, if there's any innovative solutions for that. Yeah. I can't remember the company, but I can look it up. Uh, there's a company that's actually trying to prototype wireless charging. It's like uh, Reason, R-H-E-Z-I-N. Um, not entirely positive I spelled it right. I think there's extra letters in there. But people are working on wireless technology capabilities. So you can charge your phone across the room without actually needing to plug it in. Uh, and I guess there's a way to do that based off of some of the frequencies that we're not using anymore. And it can send data and electricity across the airways. Um, Very cool. But I don't think it's actually been fully developed yet. That's all I have right now. Cool. So other cool tech. So I'm going to zip through these, and then if we have any other questions. Uh, so drones. A lot of people are talking about drones. Uh, there's lots of options out there. There's big and small options. There's cameras. Uh, when looking into drones, you've got to consider flight time. You... I think now, though, the new law, that regardless of the size of the drone, you have to maintain line of sight. Uh, and if you lose line of sight, then you're violating the, uh, the flight rules. Um, but there's a lot of, it's being regulated more, so not everyone can be doing whatever they want. I had a friend that actually built a drone from scratch where he was able to get a seven mile radius and he was able to drive away from his house and follow the expressway. Uh, and some drones have a call me home function, so when he lost connectivity, the drone would start to fly back to his house. Lots of different drone options. There's drones that can lift heavy things. There's little drones that can zip around. And for the people that love paint, there's paint drones out there that you can drive around. So lots of options with, with drones that people are investigating, what they can be capable of. People are using drones to take aerial photos and aerial videos of, of, their, 
of their spaces or buildings, um, people pay a considerable amount of money to, or people as in a commercial building, uh, real estate agents, they'll actually have a, somebody take a drown, they'll pay them a few thousand, and they have this, uh, the drown fly around the building so they can get aerial photography to help sell their building space. Um, Power Up 3.0 is actually a drone that you would put onto a paper airplane, and you build a paper airplane, and you can fly it around, and it's 50 bucks. Power Up FPV, which is coming soon, uh, is it's made from the same company. Except that this one, you will mount your phone into these wearable goggles, and you'll, in real time, stream with the drone. And as you move and tilt your head, the drone will move and tilt. So you see what the drone sees, and based on your head movement, you make the drone move. Some other crazy tech. Amazon Echo, I have one, and it's a lot of fun to play with. Uh, I actually mostly use it for music, though, uh, but I can also tell it to turn off my lights, turn on all my lights, unlock my doors, lock my doors, etc. Uh, but Amazon Echo has a really nice speaker inside of it for playing music, so I actually use it as my personal DJ. Oculus Rift for virtual reality environments. People are getting more and more involved in building virtual environments and virtual reality so you can experience things without having to be there. Um, doing virtual tours, utilizing the Oculus Rift, or going on roller coasters. Uh, the Oculus Touch, which is the a controller that you can hold into your hands that allow you to interact with whatever you're playing with versus a mouse and keyboard. As you put it all together, you get this, which is called Omni, which is a fully immersive uh, platform. So you will still need to buy an Oculus Rift and then the video games that accompany it. But essentially, if you're playing uh, like Battlefield or Call of Duty or um, that new Star Wars game that I enjoy that I can't find anyone to play with, uh, you can basically stand in here and the way of the way it works, it's concave. The mat is kind of sunken down, and you can run in place and turn around and run in all directions. And if and when you're looking in your virtual reality headset, you're actually running and moving, uh, and dodging and ducking and whatnot. And it's actually not expensive, surprisingly, because I figure they can charge a lot more for that. Project Morpheus is Sony's version of what they're looking for towards the Oculus Rift. So they're trying to build their own product and their own platform for their video game consoles. Uh, they say it's quote unquote going to be under a thousand dollars, but it's all they've released. They haven't actually even shown what they're building in terms of games. Uh, there's also Google smart contact lenses that can help read uh, insulin levels if you're diabetic and gives you that input and instant uh, information via your smart device. There's also people developing contact lens displays. So you can wear a contact lens that has, a, it's kind of hard to see, but there's two little chips in here. Uh, one's a chip and one's basically your screen. And when you wear it, you can see a, basically a screen. So you can watch movies while you're at the circulation desk. I didn't say that. Uh, and here's some things if you had a money tree. So this, I was at CES and I was wondering why is everyone huddled around this lady with a mustache? and a beard. This is a smart mirror and by sitting in front of the mirror you can choose different types of simulations like if you wanted a beard or no hair or extra hair or change your hair color and in real time as you move and you smile those features you add also move and smile. So it looks like an ordinary mirror but when you're actually sitting in front of it it will overlay whoever's sitting there and interact and it's kind of cool. And for the low price of $150,000, you can get your own jetpack. I'm uh, doing a, a fund me, so if you'd like to participate, I'll share the link. Uh, and then HoloLens, uh, where it's priced so low, you can get two of them. Uh, it's essentially, it's combining what Oculus Rift can do, and then adding on um, augmented reality, where augmented reality is more about seeing digital over a virtual real world. Virtu uh, I'll see in your virtual world over your real world. So you can blend. So in this example, the individual is Skyping with you know, a plumber, and he's saying, all right, rotate this piece that way and stick it over there, because he's seeing what she's seeing, and she's also seeing the plumber guy. Uh, and so there are a lot of really cool options Oops, next slide, that you can do. So here's, a, here's one slide of somebody interacting with their apps. Someone's building a robot or um, a spaceship and putting a, an astronaut inside and he's choosing what pieces he wants to use and just using his hands to interact. 
for for the Minecraft fans. Uh, this gentleman has built a Minecraft overlaying his physical world. All right. If you have any questions, let me know. You can also I encourage you to tweet. Encourage you to email me if you have other questions. Uh, look for me in May. I think Louise already posted the dates. So May 17th, May 18th, and May 20th. I'm doing like a little road show, bringing a lot of these hands-on products. Unfortunately, do not have the uh, jet pack, and I do not have the uh, HoloLens, but I have most of the other stuff. And then you can play with it all. Uh, but does anyone have any questions in general or anything they want to talk about or whatnot? All right. Thank you so much, Brian. I, I thought this was really fascinating to see oh, what's you. out there and, and think about how we can use these in our libraries. So thank you. Um, I don't have any questions right now, so maybe if we chat a little bit, people will, will chime in. Um, I do, I do want to mention two other things. I mean, you did mention your upcoming programs in May, and um, those will be great. Um, we also, with Rails, we have a, there's a networking group for makerspaces, a makerspace networking group that just started up. Um, they have an email uh, listserv going, and they have a Facebook page. And it's, you know, people in libraries here in the Rails service area who are connecting and networking and talking about makerspaces. And we have information about that on the Rails website and under our community area and networking groups. And when I follow up with everybody after the program, I'll share that, that link as well. And then I also wanted to mention, too, um, there is there are maker kits available to Illinois Library staff that you can check out from the Illinois State Library and play with at your library. And this started with a group from iLeadU a couple years ago, and then they got a, an extra grant to put these kits together. And the website is called Make It at Your Library. If you just Google that, you'll find it. And then they've got information about the maker, maker kits. And I can see on the website that they've got a doodle pen, a 3D doodle pen. Um, they have a 3D printer, little bits, makey makey kits, and a Sphero, and a couple other things. And um, I, said, I saw some of these demonstrated recently, and they're really cool. And you know they're free to check out. So uh, if you're, I would think if you're looking to get started at your library. Um, you might want to take a look at those. And again, that's called Make It at Your Library, and there's a big red button that says Maker Kits. And again, I'll share this in a follow-up email. So two things if you're interested in maker spaces that, that's going on. All right, I've got a couple questions for you, Brian. Um, uh, actually, these are just comments. <laughs> so. Um, Somebody asked about the PowerPoint, and uh, yes, uh, Brian has shared the PowerPoint, and we are recording this program today. So we will post the PowerPoint and the recording on the Rails um, website very soon. And everybody who registered today uh, and participated, I'll send you an email when those are ready to go. Um, there was a comment about those maker kits I just mentioned, that there are, there are some lengthy waiting lists for those, um, but still, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, another person asked about how to be part of the roadshow. Um, right now, you know, we're scheduled May 17th at the Niles Public Library, uh, May 18th at the Rockford Public Library, and May 20th at the Fond du Lac Library in East Peoria. I know the rail service area is very big, and um, we tried to scatter these throughout. But I would say if you are, um, you know, if there's a lot of interest in these programs, I would say send me a note and let me know, and you know, maybe we can hold more of these in the future. And any, are there any other questions for Brian about any of these um, things he talked about today? Or Brian, do you have anything that you'd like to add or follow up on? Um, kind of to piggyback what you were talking about, the Make It At Your Library group. Uh, I met them. Fantastic people. Uh, everyone should just check out the website regardless because um, there's actually a whole bunch of activities that you can do in terms of making and whatnot. And they like vetted all of it and it's super easy to kind of scroll through it. Uh, there's like check boxes on the left side of the screen. 
and you basically choose like your budget and the uh, time you want to spend and what age group and it gives you a list of like perfect activities you can do in your library space. Well, I do not have any more questions, so I, I guess it doesn't hurt to end early. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. Like I yeah. said, this was a lot of fun and, and really fascinating to hear about these technology things. And, thank you. Um, yep, thank you. And everybody, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar, and thanks for joining us today. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. bye.